Hello everyone, my name is Ljubo and this is uh, Ratio Podcast. It's actually more of a vodcast if you're watching <laughs> us on YouTube. Um, together with uh, Angie, today we'll try and uh, address some of our interests again into the sphere of astrophysics. If you've seen some of our previous episodes, we are highly interested specifically in physics. Mostly we're talking with a, a friend, uh, Viktor Danchev, who is a resident physicist at this point. <laughs> But uh, this time we'll be joined by no other but the illustrious Professor Avi Lopf. Uh, Avi is the founder of the Black Hole Initiative, uh, director of the Institute for Theory and Computation at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. He is also, as of late, uh, well known uh, for his book, Extraterrestrial, The First Sign of Intelligent Life uh, Beyond Earth which is based on his um, rather popular stance that uh, an object uh, in the last few years, I think 2017, uh, passed in the uh, solar system. Uh, the object was called Oumuamua. Uh, I think I'm pronouncing it right, Oumuamua. Uh, and it was allegedly an object that was of extrasolar origin. So um actually did an episode with uh, Avi, I think, in February. This year, with uh, Nicole and Petko, they addressed uh, mostly uh, this object as well as they talked a bunch of uh, time about extraterrestrial uh, life and possibility in general. Uh, today we'll be uh, as far away from this as possible, but <laughs> we're still in the scope of, um, of the cosmos. We'll try and talk about black holes. So, Avi, good to have you back. Thank you so much for having me. Just a brief update. Uh, last time we talked about the object from 2017, uh, yes. Oumuamua. But in fact, uh, there was another object that was discovered almost four years earlier uh, in uh, government data. It was a meteor, an object that collided with Earth in mm. August uh, 8th, uh, 2014, and uh, crashed into the ocean near Papua New Guinea. Oh, yes. And... Uh, uh, we uh, calculated that based on its very high speed, it must have been unbound to the sun. So that was hmm. actually the first interstellar object ever discovered by humans. It was roughly half a meter in size, released uh, a few percent of the Hiroshima bomb energy in the explosion of the meteor as it burned up in the Earth's atmosphere. And um, we argued it must have come from outside the solar system, extrapolating back in time. And our paper was uh, not accepted for publication because uh, uh, it was based on government data and the reviewers said they don't believe the U.S. government. <laughs> so a couple, a couple of months ago, the U.S. government wrote a letter to NASA uh, from the Department of Defense, the, the U.S. Uh, Space Command, asserting at 99.999% confidence that indeed this object came from outside the solar system based on its high speed. And moreover, they released the fireball data about the light curve of the explosion. And that allowed us to infer that the object was tougher than iron because it burned very low in the atmosphere. So it's very intriguing, a very fast object outside the solar system. It was moving twice as fast as typical stars move relative to the sun. And moreover, it was made of material that was tougher than iron. So we are going to retrieve the fragments of this object from the ocean floor, a hundred miles off the coast of Papua New Guinea within a few months from now. And uh, it would be really interesting to see what we find. Uh, you know, the, the fundamental question is uh, whether the object was an iron meteorite, some rare type of space rock, or was it equipment, some uh, spacecraft? Um, and just imagine new, new horizons that we launched out of the solar system uh, uh, in a billion years from now if it collides with an exoplanet, a planet around another star. Um, so, uh, it, you know, there is a chance we would find some uh, technological relic at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, I'll keep you posted. Jesus, that's that's some yeah. sci-fi shit. <laughs> <laughs> but did uh, you said that uh, initially didn't um, 
it didn't receive publication because the data uh, wasn't uh, legit apparently uh, for the reviewers but was it before uh, was it because there isn't enough information on what's the error bars uh, for the uh, for the detection or yeah so the government uh, it was uh, released publicly in a catalog all the meteors that uh, its missile warning system detected mm -hmm. because the government monitors the sky from satellites and from ground based observatories yeah. Uh, make sure that there are no ballistic missiles headed towards the U.S. or other parts. So it monitors the Optimally entire Optimally anyway, yeah. 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 And then it detects meteors, so it reported uh, the data on the meteors. These are just objects coming from space that collide with the Earth. It, the way to think of it is the Earth is like a fishing net going through space and every now and then collecting a, a fish, you know, uh, and colliding with uh, an object. And most of the time, these are rocks from the solar system. Uh, but in this particular case, it was so fast that it must have been unbound to the sun. So it came from outside the solar system. And the government reported the velocity that the object had, how fast it moved, and uh, uh, the location of where the impact was. And uh, it didn't give the error bars, didn't give the uncertainties, because that would reveal the quality of the sensors that the government is using. And to me, it sounded very reasonable that the government needs to know whether an object falls on Boston or New York City, yeah. if it's a ballistic visa. But from the reviewers of our paper, they said, well, maybe the uncertainties were very big and therefore we don't really know what this. So the government uh, asserted in a very dedicated letter, which is quite unusual for them to come to the forefront to the help of uh, uh, science in terms of providing information. Uh, and uh, they, they confirmed it. and. Now we can uh, plan an expedition because we know the location of the site. We know how much energy was released and how massive the object was. And uh, obviously, when we, if we retrieve the fragments, we can immediately tell that the object came from outside the solar system because the composition would be different. So, I mean, I'd, I'd like to probe you on this just a little bit more because it's, it's not a topic, but I think it's interesting. So, uh, you also know the trajectory uh that the object uh entered at right so yeah, yeah. and if you know the trajectory you know if it's if it came from the ecliptic or if it came from a specific uh point well, in space it, it came at an angle of uh, 28.7 degrees relative to sea level um uh, and uh, uh, we know um i mean basically the government sensors detected the fireball the explosion of the when the object, uh, as a result of its friction with the air, uh, disintegrated. And there were three flares, uh, and uh, each of them released uh, of the order of uh, terawatt, which is 10% of the world consumption in energy, uh, during a, a, a fraction of a second. And uh, that amount of energy was released in, an, uh, sort of, uh, in light. And uh, the government sensors could detect that the uh, the the fireball, the source of light, is moving at a certain speed, which is 45 kilometers per second. So that tells you the speed of the meteor at the point where it exploded. Now, you can extrapolate it back in time because it, it was slowed down by the atmosphere. So above the atmosphere, it was actually 60 kilometers per second. And then you continue the trajectory and you ask yourself, is it bound to the sun? And obviously, it was not. I mean, that was the reason we wrote the paper about discovering this first interstellar meteor. And outside of the solar system, it was moving even faster than 60 kilometers per second, it turns out. So that's uh, twice as fast as typical stars move relative to the sun. So it was an outlier in terms of moving fast relative to the sun outside the solar system. Uh, less than 5% of all the stars move that fast. And it was also an outlier in terms of its composition because it, burned, it exploded only in the lower atmosphere of the Earth, where the stress is huge. So we calculated how much stress was on the object from the uh, density of air and the speed that the object was moving. And uh, we can tell that its material strength was at least twice as large as that of iron, because otherwise it would have exploded much higher in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting stuff. And I think it's a, it's a good segue to our topic, actually, uh, because today I'd like to approach... Uh, some black hole questions that we have. So obviously we've, in the last 10 years, we've had all sorts of events about uh, black holes. It's uh, 
Uh, it's something that we've discussed in some podcasts with Victor as well. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, obviously, we wouldn't uh, bug you with all the questions about the, the really most basic questions about black holes. But I think this uh, uh, this is uh, an entry into one of your um, one, one of your articles from I think a few months back, uh, which was uh, related to. Uh, how would black holes potentially have impacted uh, life on planets and specifically life on Earth? I think that's a really curious thing because you, you mentioned now uh, that the speed of stars is uh, some kind of a, an average mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, basically uh, what you just mentioned. But uh, there was apparently some kind of drift of our sun, a, a proposed drift from uh, of our sun from the center of the galaxy of the Milky Way to where it is now. So, what's the deal with this? Can you can you elaborate a bit? Okay. Well, um, you can ask uh, what is the influence of black holes on life on Earth, um, and one uh, I important uh, thing to keep in mind is that there is a very massive black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. It's uh, four million times the mass of the Sun. And we now have an image of it that, that was released just a few months ago. Yeah. yeah. And um, and uh, uh, we this black hole is right now dormant. It doesn't uh, radiate much light, uh, but uh, uh, it could potentially, if there is a star passing very close to it that gets uh, disrupted, or if there is a gas cloud that comes close to it. And in the past, it, it did uh, light up. And when it lights up. At the position of the sun, we get uh, as much X-rays from the black hole at the center of the Milky Way as much as we get from the sun itself. So it's not a very damaging effect to the, su the solar system. But if the solar system was uh, about 10 times closer to the black hole, then uh, it, it, such a, an outburst of a black hole at the center of the Milky Way could have uh, a sterilized life. And uh, in fact, we wrote a scientific paper that where we show that in the course of galaxies, life is much more difficult uh, because of these eruptions of black holes uh, at the centers of galaxies. Now, another concern that you might have is uh, whether a black hole could pass uh, through the solar system. Is that at all a risk for us? And uh, that turns out to be a very unlikely event, except uh, there is a possibility that the dark matter is made of black holes. You know, that we don't know what most of the matter in the universe is. That's quite embarrassing because we studied the universe for a century now and uh, we still can't figure out what it's made of. Uh, it's not, we know that it's not made of the material that we are made of, uh, and that we see around us. So that's quite tantalizing to conclude that most of the stuff in the universe is not what we see in our neighborhood. Uh, and the, the question is, what is it? And one possibility is that it's made of black holes because they are dark. We can't see them. And, you know, that and now to, to, for that to be the case, you need the black holes to be uh, formed in the early universe. You can't make them recently because then you have to make them out of ordinary material. And we know that there is not enough ordinary material to explain the dark matter. So, um, so the only way to make them is very early in the universe, and then they are small. Um, they are the mass of an asteroid, for example, relatively low mass, much less than the sun. So if such a black hole actually uh, passes uh, uh, close to, our, I mean, through our body, for example, it would basically tear us apart, would kill us. I call it death by a primordial black hole. <laughs> it's a black hole and bullet. <laughs> I have uh, two daughters, and when one of them uh, was very young, she invited me to speak to her class about black holes. And one of the boys in the class said, uh, what will happen to my body if I fell uh, into a black hole? And I started describing it. And then the teacher said, wait a minute, please don't continue because the kids will have nightmares. Uh, we don't <laughs> but um, the truth is the black hole at the center of the Milky Way, for example, is so massive that um, the size of its uh, horizon, and we can get into the details, what is the, the horizon is basically the, the boundary of the prison. You can think of a black hole as a prison. It's the ultimate prison. Even light cannot escape from it. And the size of the prison is the, hori the so-called horizon of the black hole. And uh, uh, the more massive the black hole, the bigger is the horizon. And um, if an astronaut uh, goes on a journey through the horizon of the black hole at the center of the Milky Way, 
uh, there will be nothing unusual happening to the body of the astronaut because it's such a big region of space, roughly a tenth of the uh, orbit of the Earth around the sun. So it's, it's very extensive. And then uh, if, you, if you cross it, you won't feel anything. There is not much difference between the gravitational force on your head versus your toes. But as the astronaut gets uh, close to the center, the singularity, so to speak, of the black hole, then obviously the tidal forces will grow and eventually the body of the astronaut will be torn apart of anything material. Will be torn. Now, we don't actually know what is the singularity at the center of the black hole because for that you need, I mean, all we know is that Einstein's theory breaks down and, uh, and uh, you need to uh, complement it with quantum mechanics, but we don't have a theory that unifies quantum mechanics and gravity. And, and by the way, just uh, an anecdote on that, um, um, I, I came to think about the singularity of a black hole after we had a flood in our basement at home. Uh, what happened was, um, the sewer was clogged. And so I invited the plumber and together we tried to solve the problem. It turned out there were tree roots uh, blocking, uh, the sewer. And then I realized I take, I took it for granted that before that, that the water in the house goes somewhere else. But uh, apparently, you know, there is a sewer that allows them to go there. And so I started thinking what happens to matter that falls into a black hole? You know, uh, is there a, a sewer down there that takes the matter to another place? Or does it collect just like uh, the flood we had in, in my basement? Um, um, uh, does it collect in, in, in an object? You know, like you can imagine something like a star in the middle of a black hole. We don't know the answer to that. It's fascinating. And the only way to find out is to go into a black hole. But that's very dangerous. It's a one-way ticket, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yes. It, well, um, it, it, not only that, but nobody can hear you when you get there. So if you, if you take a cell phone with you, uh, you can tell a, a person on Earth that you are getting closer to the black hole. And then what will happen is, the signal will get stretched in time and eventually you will fade away. So the person on earth will not even know what happened to you once you entered because no signal can escape from the inside. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. And this is, uh, uh, this comes around to the uh, informational paradox with uh, our black holes as well, which Angie is uh, interested <laughs> in. Well, yeah, I mean, I have, I have some of uh, some of the more basic questions before that, but if you want, yeah, we can. Let's, let's go over the basic questions. We can jump right in. Uh, no, it's. I was wondering because uh, when we were talking about the size of a black hole, um, I was just interested. Do we know how big it can actually be? What's like? As can, an upper can, limit. We, right. can we? Sorry. As an upper limit. Yeah. Hmm. So the size um, was derived already. Uh, more than a century ago. So when Einstein came up with his uh, uh, general theory of relativity to describe gravity, um, he couldn't find an elegant uh, solution. And uh, Carl Schwarzschild, uh, a, a, a friend of his that was uh, the director of the Potsdam Observatory, uh, at the time, it was just around, it was November uh, two, uh, 1915, and uh, just about uh, when the Second World War started and, and uh, Karl Schwarzschild was drafted to the front, the German front, and, but he managed to find a solution, which is called the Schwarzschild solution for a black hole, sent a postcard to Einstein and Einstein published it. And in that solution, there is the, the size of the horizon from with, within w which uh, no signal can escape, okay? And that size, is proportional to the mass of the black hole. So the more massive the black hole, the more mass you put into it, the bigger is the size. So just to give you an impression, um, the size uh, of a black hole that is a uh, uh, hundred million times the mass of the sun, okay, is roughly the orbit of the earth around the sun. Okay, so that's roughly the size. And in principle, if you fill up the orbit of the earth around the sun with water, you fill the entire, then you get a hundred million solar mass black hole because that's the average density of the black hole, uh, the density of water. Uh, uh, but now if we make the mass bigger, then the size will get bigger in proportional to the mass. But the density 
will go down. The density that you need in order to make the black hole is the mass divided by the volume, and that will go down as the mass goes up because the size goes like mass and the volume goes like mass cubed, like the, the size cubed. So, so the volume grows faster than the mass, and therefore you basically can make very massive black holes by assembling gas. You don't need more than gas to make them. Um, and uh, if you want to make, for example, a black hole that is uh, roughly the mass of the sun or a few times the mass of the sun, you really need to collapse the material in a star to a very small dimension, roughly the size of a city, 10 kilometers or so. And only then there would be a high enough density, which is actually bigger than nuclear density, bigger than the density of matter in a nucleus. So um, that is difficult to accomplish. Uh, and, and you can't, um, the only way that nature does it is by when a, st- a very massive star uh, consumes its nuclear fuel and has no more uh, power being generated. So it collapses un- under its own gravity. You end up with a black hole of a few times the mass of the sun. So nature makes black holes from a few times the mass of the sun up to uh, billions of ma- uh, solar masses at the centers of galaxies out of gas that falls into the centers of galaxies. But um, and uh, it cannot make uh, black holes of smaller than a few times the mass of the sun because for that you need densities that are bigger than nuclear density. And it's really impossible to imagine circumstances except in the early universe. So the primordial black holes that I mentioned before, the mass of an asteroid, you know, they have a size uh, of the order of an atom or smaller than an atom. So they're tiny. In fact, I'm now uh, working on a paper with uh, an undergraduate student. Uh, If you put such a primordial black hole next to an atom, it can tear the atom apart because it's smaller than the size of the atom. So we are calculating how that is done. Um, then, so imagine a mass of an asteroid across a region that is the size of an atom. You were asking how big can they get? get. And uh, at the centers of galaxies, they cannot accumulate more mass than the mass that the galaxy can give them, the black hole. But actually, it ends up, uh, they end up with about uh, typically uh, a fraction of a percent of the ordinary matter uh, mass that the galaxy has. And the record is about... Uh, 10 billion times the mass of the sun. So that is roughly the, um, um, you know, the, the size of the uh, planetary system around the sun. Okay. The, the, uh, it's about a hundred times the, the earth sun separation. That's the, ra- the, the horizon or the Schwarzschild radius of a black hole of 10 billion times the mass of the sun. It's a hundred times the earth sun separation, the size of the Kuiper belt or uh, the the planetary system around the sun, so so um, it's uh, quite a, a huge thing in space, and and of course uh, if you cross that region, you don't feel anything until you hit the singularity. But if you come close to a, a black hole that is much more compact, then you immediately get torn apart because uh, the tidal forces are huge. Yeah. But would you say that, for example, uh, if let's say you have a spaceship or some kind of a, I don't know, like a space station that gets sucked in by a supermassive black hole and mm-hmm. it passes the, the radius, you know, the, the point of no return. Uh, but essentially, we have a huge amount of space inside it. So um, you'd, w- would it be possible for that spaceship or that uh, station to be there literally indefinitely because it, as long as it doesn't go inside the siphon itself, you know, the singularity, it should be fine. Or is there some kind of force that basically forces it inevitably to uh, to get sucked in into the singularity? Yeah, so once it gets into the horizon, there is no way for it to escape. And uh, even if it propels itself with a very powerful engine, it's doomed to end up in the singularity. There is no way. And one, you know, mathematically, it turns out the solution is such that, um, you know, just like time progresses always, you can't go back in time. You you can't avoid uh, hitting the singularity in a bla- once you enter the horizon. So you always have a finite, in your own frame, you have a finite amount of time before you reach the singularity. You are basically doomed. Uh, there is no way uh, uh, for you to avoid that fate. 
even if you use very powerful um, uh, rocket engine, you can just delay it a little bit, but uh, you can't avoid it. So that's why it's always uh, uh, good to stay outside the black hole. I mean, you can have a lot, you can have a lot of fun outside the black hole. For example, if you get close enough uh, at about three times the Schwarzschild radius around the black hole that is not spinning, uh, you can look straight and you will see your back because light can make a full circle. And also you age more slowly than people on Earth if you are close to a black hole. If you go back from there, uh, you will see people that aged much more than you did. So you can have a beauty salon uh, ne next to yeah, a black hole. Yeah, this is our secret actually with Lubon. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, I mean, the other advantage is you can get clean energy. That's the ultimate source of clean energy. You, you throw your trash. If, if we were a civilization near a big black hole, we could throw the trash there and get clean energy in return. Uh, almost, you know, a, a substantial fraction, much more than nuclear energy per unit mass. We, yeah. we could get 10 times more than nuclear energy per unit fuel mass. And, um, you know, that's uh, quite convenient. Um, um, but of course, there are dangers near a black hole. Aside from gravity, you know, a black hole can flare up in uh, uh, with a lot of um, luminosity that will be harmful. So, um, so yeah, there are... Pluses and minuses to being close to that. Yeah. Um, well, what about their evolution? Do they um, get to an end point where they just um, evaporate and disappear from the universe? Right. So what we discussed so far uh, is the... Uh, uh, these are the, the properties of black holes according to Einstein's theory of gravity. Okay. And that is called classical... Uh, physics in the sense that it doesn't incorporate quantum mechanics. Now, uh, we don't have a theory that unifies quantum mechanics and gravity, but Stephen Hawking back in uh, 1972... Four, I think, or two, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, um, so what happened was there was a paper by uh, Jacob Beckenstein, who was a graduate student at Princeton. He said, well, it seems to me that uh, perhaps black holes have entropy because they... There was a theorem that uh, Hawking proved before that, that uh, the area of a black hole can only grow over time. So if two black holes come together, the area of the combined system is bigger than the sum of the areas of the two black holes. He just proved it mathematically. And, and then uh, Beckenstein said, oh, that sounds like entropy. Entropy always increases disorder. You know, whenever I go to the rooms of uh, my daughters, they always are in a greater disorder than they were the day before. <laughs> um, so... Uh, so um, the, he suggested it heuristically, and then Hawking said, "Ah, oh, that makes no sense, and I will prove that it's wrong." He tried to calculate some very, in a very simple-minded way, uh, quantum mechanically, that uh, the vacuum uh, near a black hole implies that uh, there is no meaning to entropy. And uh, he, to his uh, surprise, realized that in fact there should be a mission of radiation from a black hole. And that's called the Hawking radiation. The Hawking radiation yeah. uh, and this, you know, there is an important lesson from this, that uh, in science, very it doesn't matter what motivates people, but uh, if they do their job honestly, they may come to the conclusion that is opposite of what they started with. So uh, that is very, very good, because then you, you have the potential of making discoveries as long as you're open-minded. And uh, uh, so... Uh, the result of Hawking evaporation, he called it black hole bombs, because if a black hole is very small, the evaporation is very quick, because the, basically you can think of it as um, uh, radiation with a wavelength that is the size of the horizon. So that radiation cannot be trapped inside the prison, because you cannot localize uh, uh, radiation to better than the wavelength of the radiation. That's one cycle. So if one cycle of the radiation spans a region as big as the black hole or bigger than that, you cannot really put that, that wave inside the prison <laughs> because it has already one leg outside of the prison. So that's why uh, waves with wavelengths that are bigger than the horizon manage to escape. And that is the origin of Hawking radiation, that, that uh, you cannot, you know, even though classically you have a solution that says nothing can escape from inside, in quantum mechanics, you describe particles as waves, and the, if the wavelength of the wave is uh, bigger than the size of the horizon, the waves are leaking out. 
quantum mechanically. Even though you have a prison, they leak out of the prison walls. I mean, quantum mechanics has this interesting phenomenon of tunneling. That part, you know, you know the myth of Sisyphus, the the yes. story yeah. about a person trying to lift a rock to the top of the hill, and then the rock will fall down, and then he will try. And that's a metaphor for the absurdity of life. Albert Camus uh, spoke about it, uh, but. If Albert Camus knew about quantum mechanics, he would realize that, you know, Sisyphus can sit at the bottom of the, of the hill and just wait long enough. And quantum mechanically, the rock will move from one side of the hill to the other. There is no need to push it above the hill. According to quantum mechanics, you just have to be patient. You will have, and it will tunnel. So the tunneling is very likely if the particle has a wavelength that is as big as the size of the, obstacle that it needs to go across. And that's what happens in Hawking radiation. So anyway, uh, black holes evaporate, they lose energy, and then they disappear. That's the uh, rational conclusion but, out of but the But how Hawking quick is it? I mean, okay, so, uh, the radi- uh, so since the wavelength is the size of the horizon, the more massive the black hole, the smaller is the temperature, the longer is the wavelength. Yeah. So the temperature is very high for small black holes, and very low for large, uh, so the temperature scales inversely with mass. Mm. And uh, for a black hole, the mass of the sun or bigger, the temperature is completely negligible. The black hole would take, I don't know, 10 to the power 30 or 10 to the power 100 years to evaporate, depending on the mass for astrophysical black hole. So it's a completely irrelevant process. We can't test it with astrophysical black holes. But for primordial black holes that are smaller uh, than 10 to the 15 grams or 10 to the 12 kilograms. These are black holes that have roughly the mass of a kilometer size uh, asteroid. Okay. If such black holes below that will evaporate over the age of the universe or, or shorter. And the smaller they are, the faster they evaporate. So that's why it's like a bomb. You start with a black hole, let's say the mass of an asteroid, it starts to evaporate and then it gets quicker and quicker, the evaporation process. And eventually it's extremely quick. So uh, it's like an explosion. And then the question, there is a fundamental question that Hawking recognized after that, and the community of physicists hasn't resolved yet. And that is, suppose you throw the Encyclopedia Britannica, or that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, so let, let's imagine a book. You, you throw a book into a black hole, and the bla- a black hole, according to Einstein's gravity, can be characterized only by three numbers, the mass, the spin, how much rotation it has, and the charge. So these are just three numbers, like elementary particles, you know. But then I threw an entire book into it. Where is the information? Uh, well, you might say, okay, it's inside. Just like if you throw uh, the same book into a well, you know, and, and then you can't see it because it's down in the well, you know, it doesn't mean that the book disappeared. The information is in the... So uh, as long as the black hole is still there, you could say, okay, well, the information is inside the horizon. But then Hawking says, well, the black hole will evaporate eventually and will become nothing, just radiation, thermal radiation. So where is the information? We started with a book and a black hole, and we end up with just thermal radiation that carries no information except for the temperature um, of the black hole as it evaporates. So... um, uh, it's unresolved. This paradox is still, uh, there are various suggested solutions for it, but uh, it's still work in progress. Um, uh, so that's, that's the information paradox. Yeah. Uh, but okay. We're, we're talking about information all the time. Um, and giving this, uh, easy to understand metaphors with books and, uh, astronauts and, uh, et cetera, uh, uh, jumping and throwing into the, um, black holes and, um, the event horizon. But can we define what we mean exactly by information? Because mm. it's, I'm pretty sure it's not really a book or an apple or <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> from the perspective of, I mean, um, the, there is a very quanti- a simple quantitative way to define information, and uh, um, uh, and that's uh, uh, you know you can uh, describe by how many bits uh, you need to store um, the content of something, and um, and and, and uh, also you can relate it to entropy. And um, but in any event, um, th- there is a sense of order that when when you have a book. 
you know, that there is uh, uh, some order in the way the letters are put in it. And uh, there is, we assign some meaning to the letters, but even without that, that, that there is some order that, uh, and then when you get just radiation out of it, um, you know, if it's completely thermal and characterized by one number, the temperature, it, it obviously doesn't carry the same order that uh, used to be there to start with. And so the, 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 the question is what happened to that uh, content that was in the book? Uh, where did it go? And um, uh, usually, according, uh, the reason it's a paradox is because according to uh, quantum mechanics, um, information cannot be lost. It's just exactly, uh, changing. Yeah. For example, if you throw the book into the sun, then there would be information encoded in the radiation coming out of the sun. It's very subtle, but in principle, it's there. According to quantum mechanics, information is never lost. That's called unitarity. So there is something here that involves gravity and quantum mechanics, and that's where the difficulty lies. And uh, in my mind, this um, uh, paradox is part of... Um, uh, you know, is probably reflecting our ignorance and how we unify quantum mechanics and gravity. Since we don't have a good theory um, uh, that unifies the two, um, we can't really resolve this paradox. And, and the, the same about the Big Bang, you know, what happened before the Big Bang. That's another singularity that uh, comes out of ha Einstein's theory. And uh, Einstein didn't like it. He wanted the universe to exist forever. And uh, the question is what happened before the Big Bang, you know, and uh, and uh, if if we ever meet an extraterrestrial civilization, that would be uh, close to the top of my list of questions to ask them. Do they know what happened before the Big Bang? Because my um, uh, I would like to know, for example, uh, if you have a, a theory that unifies quantum mechanics and gravity, can you engineer a baby universe? Can you create a baby universe in the laboratory? Because if you can. Perhaps the, before the Big Bang, there was a laboratory and there were some uh, entities there with uh, lab, lab suits, you know, white suits <laughs> that uh, mixed some things and made our universe. Sci-fi again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... So, uh, uh, so that's a singularity. I mean, we know that we can make a black hole uh, in, in, in the laboratory in principle, but uh, a baby universe, we don't know. But... Can we? Sorry to interrupt you, but mm -hmm. when you say we know uh, to make a, a black hole, I I I can't I cannot stop myself from asking: Can we actually destroy a black hole? Ah, no. That as far as we know, we can't. Ah. Uh, the only way that a black hole can <laughs> the only way to get, to get rid of a black hole is for it to evaporate. Yeah. Uh, there is no. Uh, so that that okay. Without quantum mechanics, just classically based on Einstein's theory, that was the area theorem that I mentioned before. That if if there was a way of getting rid of a black hole, it would mean that you can reduce its area. You can get rid of it. It used to have some area, and now you you uh, you removed it, and the area goes to zero. And according to the theorem that Stephen Hawking proved back in the 60s, that is impossible. That all that the structure of Einstein's theory of gravity does not allow that. Area always increases when you play with black holes. And uh, of course, quantum mechanically, he violated his own theorem by showing that black holes evaporate. But that's because of quantum mechanics. And, uh, you know, we don't know of a process by which we can uh, take some uh, substance and mix it with a black hole to get rid of the black hole. We, we don't know of any process that does that. Mm. Yeah. But when we are talking about... Um... A black hole, it's also always like a perfect sphere in three dimensions. I mean, that, there's always this idea about uh, geometrization of, of space. But because uh, there's a bunch of propositions, including from the ever hated by you and probably by me as well, uh, string theory, uh, <laughs> that there are some proposals for different types of dimensionalities up to like 11 dimensions, etc. So is there any um, argument that black holes could have different forms depending on the, the way they're formed or if they're primordial yeah. or something else? Yeah, so one, different uh, dimensionalities. Property, one property that changes the structure of a black hole is the speed. So if a, if a black hole is non-spinning, that is the Schwarzschild solution that I mentioned before, that's a spherical black hole. But if it has a spin, then the, instead of a sphere, it becomes an ellipsoid or an oblate, a, 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 
an object that is flattened along the poles, okay? And uh, it, uh, the structure of space and time becomes more complicated. So in fact, if you put the particle close to such a spinning black hole, the particle will be dragged because space and time will be spinning together with the black hole. Uh, and uh, so uh, indeed it's not spherical. So when you have spin, you get, and the, the spin has a maximum value that you can get to where uh, space and time get really squashed uh, at the maximum level. Now, um, with respect to string theory, I should say that at one of the conferences at the Black Hole Initiative that I founded at Harvard University, um, I mentioned to my string colleagues that uh, uh, in one of the future meetings, we will organize a trip to a black hole because I do think that for them, it's the only place where they can test their theory by entering the horizon of a black hole. So one of them in the background, uh, Nimar Kani Hamad, uh, raised his hand and said, uh, well, you have an ulterior motive of sending string theories into a black hole, <laughs> uh, which, which I did not deny. Um, <laughs> but, but, uh, but indeed, you know, if, if uh, you wanted to test string theory, you would go close to the singularity. That's the place. Now, with respect to extra dimensions, we don't have direct evidence for them. And there was a suggestion that maybe we can do experiments that would test millimeter scale extra dimensions. And that experiment was done. It was ruled out. Uh, so, uh, you know, if they, if they exist, they must be curled up on a scale that we can't really probe at the moment. Okay, so there's no specific characteristics that would... Uh the emergence of the existence of additional dimensions in a black hole, basically. No. And uh, one interesting point is that um, the LIGO experiment detected gravitational waves from black holes colliding. So we know about the existence of black holes, not just from imaging them through the Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, that we, uh, you know, the first image of a black hole was obtained at the Black Hole Initiative uh, uh, at Harvard. And, uh, uh, but uh, uh, beyond the light that is emitted from gas swirling into a black hole, like water down the sink. Uh, aside from that, we can actually uh, observe black holes without any light uh, generated by any material that produces light here. Uh, and that is gravitational waves, because when two black holes come together, they produce ripples or a storm in space and time that propagates out. And we can see the signal with the LIGO experiment uh, in particular, and uh, so uh, stellar mass black holes of uh, between a few solar masses up to a hundred solar masses were detected from uh, the gravitational waves uh, that were emitted by them. And um, and the one thing we learn is they seem to agree perfectly with Einstein's theory of gravity with the predictions. You can uh, find excellent uh, description of the high signal to noise events and. Uh, that implies that there is no leakage of gravitational waves into extra dimensions. So if, if there was some energy leaking into the extra dimensions, we would notice that we, that we don't get perfect agreement with the Einstein's theory of gravity in three plus one dimension. So th there is no, uh, so that is, of course, um, uh, natural if the extra dimensions are, are, um, curled up on very small scales, but because the gravitational waves have very long wavelengths, so they would never go into the extra dimension that is curled up on a much smaller scale. But uh, at any event, um, so far we, we don't have a, a, an experimental reason for thinking about extra dimensions. It's just in the minds of some theorists, and uh, it has been half a century, uh, and I say, well, you know, we can spend our life uh, worrying about things that may not exist, like uh, how many angels can dance on the tip of a pin. Uh, and of course, you know, if you have a big enough community, will be you will feel justified dealing with that, and that's what's going on right now. But um, I think we have more urgent things to attend to, such as objects we don't understand in the sky, anomalous mm. objects. Mm. When when we were talking about uh, gravity waves, uh, you had an article about uh, the displacement of the moon due to potentially yeah. uh, a really big gravity wave. Can you elaborate yeah. on this a bit? Oh, yeah. So uh, that's a fun calculation. Um, during the pandemic, I had uh, time for myself to do creative work. So that included writing scientific papers, writing uh, commentaries, and I'm finishing my next book now. Uh, and so in one of those papers, I uh, calculated that if at the center of the Milky Way, there wasn't just one black hole, but there was a companion to the black hole. So 
another black hole orbiting around it with a mass that is a fraction of the mass of the big black hole, um, then it would generate gravitational waves. And, uh, and as a result, uh, you know, the moon would uh, get displaced relative to the Earth. And the, the amazing thing is that it's measurable because we have lunar ra ranging. Uh, the, uh, the Apollo uh, program uh, left some uh, reflectors on the surface of the moon, and you can bounce lasers off these reflectors and measure the distance to the moon very precisely. And there has been uh, such measurements over decades and uh, uh, since the Apollo program. And uh, uh, they got to a very high precision, one part in 10 to the 12th uh, precision in measurements of uh, uh, as to how uh, small uh, is the deviation from uh, what you expect based on um, Einstein's theory of gravity and or Newtonian gravity. And uh, if there was such a wave passing by, it would basically separate the Earth and the Moon be because the wavelength uh, is comparable to the Earth-Moon separation, I showed. And uh, that's an interesting point that uh, a gravitational wave passing through can actually be seen by monitoring the motion of the Moon relative to Earth. Um, so I found that uh, quite interesting. I, I also wrote a number of other interesting uh, ideas about um, uh, testing general relativity. Uh, for example, you know that uh, I talked before about the dark matter. We don't know what most of the stuff in the universe is, but an alternative to that would be to say, well, there is no missing matter. We are not missing any matter. The matter is the one that we have, we, we, we have around us. We are just missing the fact that gravity is modified. You know, gravity does not behave the way we expect it at very low accelerations. And that is a theory that was proposed more than 40 years ago. Uh, and uh, it's called Modified Newtonian Dynamics, MOND. And uh, it basically suggests that maybe the inertia of matter is uh, smaller when the acceleration is smaller. So you, you think that there is more gravity, but there is not more gravity. It's just that the inertia, the inertia of matter is uh, smaller. So it, matter can be affected more easily by the same force. And I said, well, you know, if that's the case, we can test it because we can build a rocket. And you know, a rocket suffers from the so-called tyranny of the rocket equation. Since Sputnik until now, all the rockets that we launched to space, all of them reached roughly the same speed of several tens of kilometers per second. You may ask yourself, why? Why can't we improve on that? you know, over the past um, 70 years? And the answer is uh, because of the tyranny of the rocket equation, which basically says that the amount of fuel, the mass of the fuel relative to the payload has to grow exponentially with the increase in the final speed. So if you want to, uh, for example, if you take a million times more mass in the fuel than the payload is, so you have a tiny payload with a million times more mass in the fuel, you can get uh, to a certain speed, uh, and then you can increase the speed maybe by 25% if you change the amount of the, the fuel mass by a factor of a thousand. If you make it a thousand times bigger, it's just changing by 20% the final speed. So it's very little. And the reason is that you have to carry the fuel with you as you get accelerated by the rocket effect. So uh, if, on the other hand, if this theory is correct and you if you were to accelerate at low accelerations, the, the rocket, you don't need to carry a lot of fuel because the inertia is smaller. And it turns out that the tyranny of the rocket equation disappears. So here is a way of testing whether gravity is modified uh, in, in this way or whether there is dark matter just by uh, building a rocket that accelerates very at, at low accelerations and seeing that you know, the, with the same, with a relatively small amount of fuel, you can reach very high speeds. Uh, so a, a, another, this is another interesting test of gravity. And, and let me mention another test of gravity that I wrote about, which is related to black holes. You know, if you imagine a black hole that we discussed before, it has the size of the Schwarzschild radius, let's say, if it's not spinning, so that's the size. And uh, you take the mass of the black hole, multiply it by the speed of light squared, E equal mc squared, you know, that was another result from Einstein. That's the maximum amount of energy that you can associate with that black hole. You take all this energy, mc squared, 
and you release it over the shortest amount of time that you can. What is the shortest amount of time? It's the Schwarzschild radius or the horizon, the size of the horizon divided by the speed of light. That's the shortest amount of time you can release this energy. So you take all the energy, release it in the shortest time. This is surely the maximum power that you can generate. So if you ask yourself, suppose I have a lamp, a, 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 a light bulb, how luminous can a light bulb get? How, what is the highest luminosity that the light, you know, we usually work with a hundred watts. What is the limit? How, how many watts can we have on a light? And the answer is this one, mc squared divided by the, the light crossing time of the Schwarzschild radius. Now the Schwarzschild radius is proportional to mass. And mc squared is proportional to mass. So the mass drops out from this calculation and you end up with a luminosity, a maximum power, maximum luminosity that is completely independent of the mass. It's just related to the speed of light and Newton's constant. And there, so there is a maximum luminosity that a light bulb can have in nature, which is the speed of light to the uh, fifth power divided by Newton's constant. That's mm -hmm. it. That's an interesting point. That's really fucking interesting as well. <laughs> um, there's one, um, there's one point I'd like to get back to because, uh, we have a trip into black holes. Um, and when we're talking about especially supermassive black holes that in the center of galaxies, etc., um, surely they have some effect on the galaxies themselves and on the formation of, uh, the, the whole topography, if you will, of the galaxies, because um, not so, I'm guessing not only gravitationally, but also some other effects. So would oh, you yeah, say the, they play a role in like uh, yeah. star formation? So as, the, as I mentioned before, um, black holes at the centers of galaxies grow to a fraction of a percent, usually 0.1% of the, of the mass in ordinary matter. And you may ask, why is that? Why don't they consume everything? Okay, or a significant, more significant fraction. And the answer is because when they consume that much mass, they release so much energy because there are such efficient engines of converting rest mass to radiation that they basically uh, uh, remove the food off the table. They, they get rid of the uh, gas that feeds them. Uh, so you can think of the, I mean, the process takes only tens of millions of years. So it's a very short amount of time relative to the age of the universe. They consume some gas and then they produce so much energy that they remove the rest of the gas. And so it's just like an explosion. And we see those explosions in the form of what is called quasars. Um, these are luminous uh, uh, sources that are basically the black hole shining very brightly when it eats up the gas in the galaxy. And the way to think of it is like a baby. You know, imagine a baby eating. Uh, and then uh, out of a bowl. And as the baby eats more and more, uh, the baby becomes more and more energetic. And eventually it removes the food off the table, off the bowl. And uh, that's what happens in the centers of galaxies, that black holes become so energetic that they remove eventually the, the food. Uh, and so uh, uh, therefore the mass that the black hole obtains uh, is related to how deep is the gravitational potential well that binds the gas that feeds them. And that, that, that is related to the characteristic speed of stars in the galaxy. So there is this very nice correlation between the black, the mass of a black hole at the centers of galaxies and the characteristic speed of stars in the spheroid of stars that surround it. So basically bigger black holes sit in, in bigger galaxies, in, in massive galaxies, and smaller black holes are in smaller galaxies. And, and uh, back in, in 2020, there is an interesting story. I, um, uh, observers were seeing some correlations of black hole masses with the luminosities of galaxies. And I suggested to two of them, um, two young people that were, um, um, that passed through Harvard uh, because they were candidates for junior faculty position that we had. I suggested to both of them to check the correlation between the mass of a black hole and the characteristic speed of stars near the black holes. And uh, they said, okay, we'll, we'll check it out. And then uh, within a few months, both of them came back to me and said, wow, there is this correlation and we would like to publish it. And I said, go ahead. And then the two teams competed with each other 
because it became the, the hottest subject in the in the field. Um, so to answer your question, uh, black holes have a huge influence on the galaxies that surround them because they clean up the gas when they light up. And then they, for example, suppress uh, the formation of stars in the host galaxy when they uh, exp- when there is this energy release. And so, indeed, they have a huge influence, not gravitational. I mean, gravity brings gas to them, but then the effect that they have is releasing the energy that clears out the gas from gla- galaxies. But would that have an effect on the on the? type of galaxies that we see i mean w- would that be part of the reason we see these spiral galaxies for example oh yeah so that's a very interesting point so um uh, for example big galaxies they are called elliptical galaxies that's what will happen to our galaxy when it will collide with the andromeda galaxy its sister galaxy nearby when the two galaxies will collide they will merge together to make sort of an elliptical looking galaxy a, a galaxy that looks like a a, 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 a spheroid, a, a sort of a, a football, American football, you know, kind of. Um, and there are lots of such elliptical galaxies. Usually they are the more, uh, I mean, the most massive galaxies are of that type. Um, and in them, there is often a, the most massive black holes. And because of that, because there is a very massive black hole at, its, at their center, they don't have any cold gas uh, in, in the form of a disk. Uh, like the Milky Way does. Um, and so um, it, it is understood that perhaps uh, the merger of the two galaxies that made the big galaxy resulted in fueling the black hole until it grew to a very large mass such that it cleared out or heated the gas. And you never end up with a small disk in the middle. However, these galaxies, uh, they have a smaller black hole at their center and um what happens is that you do make a disk of gas and the gas uh, makes uh, fragments into stars and you end up with a Milky Way-like uh, galaxy this way. But the black holes at the centers are not as luminous. They don't have as strong of a feedback on the rest of the galaxy. So you do have still the disk shape. And there is a whole continuum between these galaxies and elliptical galaxies. In fact, many elliptical galaxies have a tiny disk in the middle uh, and many ellipti- many uh, disk galaxies like the Milky Way have a bulge in the middle, which is sort of like an elliptical galaxy. So it's all about the ratio of the disk versus the spheroid. So if the spheroid is compact and the disk is bigger, you call it a disk galaxy or a spiral galaxy. If it's the other way around, you call it an elliptical, but it, there is a continuum between the two. But what... Would that influence of uh, black holes on galaxies be a necessary prerequisite in order to have a galaxy to begin with? I mean, can we no, imagine no. a galaxy without black holes? Because mm. we have examples right now of two black holes that we've detected. Oh, no. So it looks like uh, every gal- almost every galaxy has a black hole at its center, ex- I mean, uh, for the big galaxies, we can easily infer the existence of the black hole. The small galaxies, it's more challenging, but uh, there, there may be some exceptions, but um, a very mi- small minority. In general, galaxies have a black hole at, at their center, and it's thought that it's, it's a byproduct of galaxy formation. So whenever you assemble gas into a galaxy, a fraction of the gas uh, you know, condenses in the center and feeds the black hole. And, Sort of like uh, water spiraling down uh, the sink. Uh, you end up with uh, the water in the hole at the middle. Uh, and then uh, the only reason that this process stops is because the black hole itself becomes powerful so that it clears the gas. But if there was no feedback of that nature, you would get much more mass channeled into the central black hole. Um, and it, in that case, our Milky Way galaxy, instead of having 4 million times the mass of the sun, it, it would have had a black hole of 4 billion times the mass of the sun, you know, something quite substantial. And that would have affected life on Earth. So we, sh- we should be grateful for this feedback that suppresses the growth of this baby. You know? <laughs> uh, I have uh, one last question. Okay. We- Go so, ahead. Uh, because we, we, we mentioned primordial black holes a bunch of times, and I think they're really fascinating in a, uh, in a very disturbing fashion. <laughs> um, so... Essentially, the, 
the universe is kind of like a shooting range, potentially, where it's primordial black holes. But wouldn't that mean that we'd see a lot more interactions of such black holes with uh, random objects? Uh, oh, yeah. So that, that is how we put... Um, this is an excellent point. That's how we put limits on the possibility that the dark matter is made of primordial black holes. And in fact, I should say that almost the entire range of possible masses is ruled out. Almost all of it. That there is a small window around asteroid masses, but it's very unlikely that the dark, it's very unlikely the dark matter is made of uh, primordial black holes based on all the constraints along the lines that you just mentioned, because these black holes would interact with either stars or with gas in ways that would change uh, things that we see, okay? And we don't see that, and so you can rule out black holes. You can also rule them out because they would, for example, focus light from a star behind them, and you would see that, and so that's called gravitational lensing, and uh, that puts limits on uh, black holes of masses comparable to that of the sun, or even smaller than that, uh, the mass of the Earth. Um, so altogether, it looks like uh, it's very unlikely that the dark matter is made of primordial black holes. So we don't know if primordial black holes exist. Uh, it's a speculation. Um, and uh, what we do know is that uh, black holes forming out of the collapse of stars, it definitely exists. Black holes forming out of the condensation of gas at the centers of galaxies definitely exist. And, you know, uh, the nearest black hole to us could be at a distance of uh, tens of light years from us. Uh, but uh, we don't have to worry that it will come close to us if there are no primordial black holes. There is no risk um, uh, of, of any damage that will happen as a result of, of a black hole, unless you come uh, on purpose. If you take a spaceship and come close to it, then, of course, you are at risk. Yeah. There was this uh, article in New Scientists, I think, uh, a few months back, about uh, really low mass black holes, let's say earth mass type of black holes. Yeah, so that, this should be primordial. Yeah. yeah. So if um, the, the proposal was that such a black hole could um, potentially collide, let's say, with a neutron star or some kind of other massive object. And the way that this would work is really, really weird in the sense that it this collision would potentially lead to the black hole eating the neutron star from the I inside. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually wrote a paper about that uh, seven years ago, and uh, indeed that we tried to rule out the possibility that uh, that uh, the dark matter is made of such uh, black holes because otherwise neutron stars would not exist. Yeah, exactly as you say. Uh, so that's one way of limiting the abundance. The uh, primordial black holes, the effect they have on stars, the effect they have on gas. Uh, and, you know, it, it doesn't look, it doesn't seem likely that primordial black holes were made based on all of these constraints. And also you need the mechanism to make them in the early universe. You basically uh, need some process that um, takes all of the energy within the horizon of the universe and enhances it enough for them for that energy to collapse to a black hole. And, and so far, there wa weren't any compelling mechanisms for doing that. So I would say the, it's a speculation whether primordial black holes exist, um, but the, we have plenty of other black holes to study. So there is definitely not a, sh a shortage. And we have an image of a black hole. We have the gravitational waves detected from a black hole. And, um, you know, the, it, there is a lot of excitement in the study of black holes what I would like to um, uh, find in the future is something that deviates from the expectation, some, because only through that we will learn something new. And uh, uh, so far we haven't had anything that deviates from what we expect about black holes. So uh, although it's uh, reassuring that Einstein was correct, it's, uh, it's also boring. Uh, I would like uh, <laughs> excitement. <laughs> So uh, basically, Avi, you, you, you're trying to, in a way, uh, make a scientific provocation uh, <laughs> to the status quo. <laughs> I mean, I can see, I can see you kind of doing it with uh, most of your, uh, most of the topics uh, you yeah. engage. You try and figure out places that we're not going right now, even if oh, they look a bit sci-fi-ish. 
<laughs> well, it's all about gaining new knowledge. You see, we live for a finite amount of time and uh, there is an island of knowledge in an ocean of ignorance. Okay. And we want to expand the island, the mass, uh, the, the, the land mass of this island. And, and uh, that's what I'm about as a scientist. You know, I want to find something that was not known already. So I don't want to spend my life just confirming what we already know. Okay. That's boring. Uh, I, I think doing science is fun. You know, a week ago, my students uh, and postdocs, former, uh, celebrated my 60th birthday at uh, Martha's Vineyard. And, um, you know, I was very moved by, by this conference because uh, a lot of them came to tell me that I had an impact on their life. And to me, it was uh, the first time they said that. And uh, they mentioned also at the banquet some anecdotes about me helping that I completely forgot about. But then um, it's sort of like an academic uh, DNA that I gave them and uh, they carry it into the world. And it's an academic family. There is a bliss to an academic family. But then um, what I try to, I mean, the one common denominator, uh, the common thread that runs through all of them uh, that I could notice in that week is that they are open-minded, they are curious, they regard the scientific process as fun. You know, it's not about... Um, uh, accounting, you know, it's not about uh, confirming things we already know and uh, giving each other awards. It's more about uh, the fun of discovery. And, you know, that's what um, is, is still makes it fun for me. You know, I'm not um, about, about the titles that I acquired. I, I don't care so much about um, my past knowledge. I, I don't want to be regarded as an expert because an expert is basically saying, um, you know, all I know would allow me to explain everything I would face in the future, because that's the meaning of being an expert. I want to be surprised. I want to see uh, things that I've never expected, anomalies that will teach me something new. You want, want to be to, an explorer. <laughs> and I want to, and that's what we will do in Papua New Guinea. We will explore the ocean floor. You see, and that's what makes it fun and um, uh, exciting. Science does not need to be boring. You know, and. It's not a matter of a, a bunch of old people pretending to know everything <laughs> that, that you have to listen to in a classroom. You know, that, that is really not the way. And I would like to maintain my childhood curiosity. And I, I'm willing to be wrong because very often, you know, you think something is exciting. It turns out to be wrong. Uh, so fine. Uh, so then we move on. But the one thing to keep in mind is the mainstream uh, people who are boring experts, you know, they would tell you that you need to invest $10 billion in the Large Hadron Collider, okay, in order to find supersymmetry, which uh, in, a, in a very natural range of parameters. And for decades, that was discussed and everyone agreed, yeah, supersymmetry. In fact, people even assumed su supersymmetry is correct and built on it string theory, uh, super string theory. So they, are, they said, okay, supersymmetry, we know it exists. And then goes the Large Hadron Collider, looks for supersymmetry in the natural parameter space and doesn't find it. Now, did anyone declare that they were wrong in predicting that this is the natural range of parameters that the Large Hadron Collider will find? No. I mean, they predicted it. It turned out to be wrong. That's the way scientific process is, is done. And I, I, I don't want them to admit that they made a big mistake, that the awards, they, they to give back the awards they got for inventing supersymmetry. That's okay. But uh, at the same time, uh, the, the innovation and uh, being willing to entertain possibilities that are uh, off the beaten path should not be dismissed ahead of their time. And uh, in particular, if there are anomalous objects in the sky that could be artificial, you know, let's uh, study them rather than dismiss, because even the mainstream makes mistakes again and again. And, and th these mistakes do cost money. It's like $10 billion. Like, for example, in the search for technological artifacts, you know, extraterrestrial equipment, it, for a hundred million dollars, we can make a huge amount of progress. That's just one percent of the budget of the Large Hadron Collider. So I said, OK, we made a mistake there in predicting something that doesn't exist. It was a hundred times more expensive than even if I make a mistake in, in saying these are these objects are anomalous. Let's find out what they are. You know, it wouldn't cost us more than one percent of that. So there needs to be some balance uh, yeah. in the way we uh, allocate resources. Hmm. Well, Avi, I think 
<laughs> I think we're reaching the limit of uh, of your time now. Uh, we probably took more than an hour or something. <laughs> Thank you again for uh, taking the time and uh, discussing black holes and a bunch of other yeah. related <laughs> topics. It was really, really fun. Definitely, Thank if you if you uh, if you like, I'd I have a bunch of more topics that I'd like to pick your brain about. If you're interested, we definitely are. Sure, yeah. I will be delighted. And um, um, in fact, I I wish I could have spoken with you Bulgarian uh, because my mother came from, from Bulgaria and uh, I'm very proud of that. Uh, half of my DNA is Bulgarian. So um, uh, anytime you want to speak with me, I'm here to. Uh, <laughs> you. So amazing. Thank you. amazing. That's, that's really kind of you. Thank yeah. you again for your time today. And maybe next time you'll visit Sofia and also Casco. <laughs> As we oh, yeah. yeah, that would be fun. this would be great. Uh, I, 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 that would remind me of the food that I enjoyed during my childhood. Uh, Borekas and all of these. Nice. Okay, so uh, <laughs> let's thank our audience as well. Thank you guys uh, for being with us uh, for the past hour something. Uh, Avi has been really forthcoming with explaining stuff related to black holes. Uh, if you've enjoyed this content uh, and if you'd like us to do more videos and continue doing our podcast as well, you can support us at ratio.bg support. Thank you again for watching. <laughs>